I'm Mr. Beat. I'm doing a live stream about big decisions the Supreme Court is going to be making in this current session. All right. So basically, we have a few cases that they are having a hard time reaching a decision for. Okay. Um, and we're going to look at some of those that stand out to me that are truly historic. It's going to be, it's looking to be a very historic next few weeks. Okay. The Supreme Court session typically lasts from the beginning of October to the end of June slash early July. And so we should be hearing a lot of big decisions soon, hopefully, but I have read that they are having a hard time reaching uh, a consensus. Well, they do anyway, right? Because you, as you know, you're watching here, you know that we have a divided court. We have clearly some justices that lean to the left and clearly some that lean to the right. And then our boy, Anthony Kennedy, who is one of my favorite justices of all of in American history, because he's one of those guys that doesn't seem as political as the rest. He pretty much seems to be more like, oh, I'm just going to ignore my own biases and look at what the Constitution is as a document, how it has been interpreted in the past. But yeah, they're all biased to it to, to some degree. But we're going to look at a few of those cases here tonight. Uh, this is the story that caught my attention in the USA Today when I read it earlier this week. And it basically just succinctly laid it all out so that you can see this is what is at stake. And these are decisions that will have an impact on many Americans, if not all Americans. So I'm going to start with my uh, the case I've been looking at the most, the case I've been looking at more than any, and that is Gill v. Whitford. It's so important that I printed this out. Don't tell my school. I printed it out uh, on their printer. So what Gill v. Whitford is about is about gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is the process of how districts are divided up in this country. So whoever is in power at the state legislature generally is, they're the ones who draw up the districts in each state. And lately it seems to have been mostly Republicans who have been smarter about this as far as dividing them to their advantage. But I'm going to show you uh, kind of at, what's the root of this problem? Why so many people hate gerrymandering? So let me, uh, first I'm going to, share the, the screen here with you. And we're gonna take a look at what I'm talking about. All right, so first of all, you got, I gotta open up the right window. I have a million windows open. So you can, you can crack, you can stack, and you can pack a district. And I'll go over that here in a little bit, but I wanted to show you how this works here. And, it's uh, this is a fair vote fairvote.org article that shows you how to steal an election. I think this is kind of the best thing we have to kind of show where this can go wrong. So say you have 60% blue uh, precincts, meaning 60% of these precincts within a district are democratic. They're registered democratic, okay? The Democratic Party. <laughs> okay, and 40% of the uh, these precincts are registered Republican. Well, they have to divide up these districts to their advantage. So if you have the blue team, the Democratic Party, that uh, divides them up, if they're in power, they're gonna have five districts that looks like the middle one. Whereas if you have the Republicans in the legisl legislature that are drawing up the districts, they're gonna draw maybe like this, so that red team wins, the Republican Party has the advantage. And you see this, you know, every time there's a, a census, every time there's an opportunity to draw new districts up, this is what happens. This has happened since the early days of the country. Gerrymandering uh, comes from Elbridge Gerry. The uh, he was the first uh, politician to successfully do this, and that, that it comes from his name. That was in the at the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, when this first like, wow, well, let's do this, and here we are in 2018, and partisan gerrymandering has gotten out of control. And so the Supreme Court is looking at how to resolve this um, and do do some lawsuits. There's actually three separate cases they have combined. They're looking at these together. In addition to Gil v. Whitford, there's Benesic, Benesic v. Lamone, and there is Abbott v. Perez. 
and all of them are related. Um, there's different ways that gerrymandering is happening. There's racial gerrymandering that uh, there's, I think, uh, I mean, there's there's other ways you can kind of divide up districts to kind of favor one political party or the, or the other. But the bottom line is it's partisan at the at its root, okay? And so the reason why I find this uh, extremely important is because you think about, okay, if we fix the problem of gerrymandering, then we have a better democracy. We have a, a better functioning democracy. Now, we are a democratic republic. I get constantly re reminded by that, and people forget that th this all the time. Like, we choose representatives to really do the work for us on our behalf because we don't have the time to view all this legislation. Um, but when we have so many constituents across the country who are not represented accurately, and you see this more and more and more, then you have a very low approval rating of Congress. One of the reasons why we have such a low approval rating of Congress right now, I think it's like 15% or something or 10% even, is because of gerrymandering. There, are, I have never met anyone who likes gerrymandering, who think it's a good idea. The people just do it because it's the best way that they can try to fight for their team in an election, okay? Um, because you know that if you live in a district that historically votes uh, one way or the other, and it's not your team, you're not going to get represented. Why would you even bother voting? Okay, so there's this representation disconnect. All right. Um, so it starts this specific case. I'll just give you the details of Gil v. Whitford specifically. Um, but you know, so we have in was the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this is where this originates, and they, all right, so I'm just going to read this so I don't get it wrong. Okay, so in 2011, the redistrict, redistricting plan for the state of Wisconsin was created by Republican legislatures to maximize the likelihood that they would be able to secure additional seats in the state legislature. And the plan was challenged by Democratic citizens uh, claiming the redistricting, redistrict redistricting plan caused their votes to be wasted. The case was filed in 2015, and by 2016, the District Court for the Western District of Wisconsin ruled in favor of the Democrats based on the efficiency gap measure that they developed for the case. They ordered Wisconsin to redo its districts by 2017. The state appealed the ruling to the Supreme Court, who heard the case last October. The court is really struggling with this one. From what I've read, they just, they're like, yeah, we know gerrymandering is a problem, but what is the solution? What is the solution? So let's look at some of these solutions here. I'm going to show you um, that there are solutions out there. So let's take a look. Um, if you go to, let's see here, policymap.com, there, there's a great article that was written last summer that gives you some potential solutions. Independent commissions, algorithm, algorithms, which is my personal favorite. If you get math involved with this, then you get rid of the political element, the, you know, the natural human error that's gonna come with this. Um, a political voting system. I'm gonna give this link, I'm gonna post this link in the video description afterwards. I just wanted to give you a heads up. There are solutions out there. So to me, I think if they were able to, they have seen some of these solutions. I know that they're, they have talked to experts uh, during oral arguments. They heard, um, you know, po possible alternatives to the current system we have now. There's another article uh, that has what's known as the, uh, it's like the cake plan. I like, uh, it's, I wanted to share this one because uh, it's, it's very unique. Um, so the state legislature, um, would um, whoever's in power would draw all the districts in the state, and then the other party in power would pick the district they preferred and freeze it. Then they would switch roles, and then the other the the party that uh, didn't pick the first time would now now pick redraw the remaining districts, and then the other party would freeze their preferred district of the ones they redrawn, and they go back and forth, and that's why they call it the. Uh, kind of the cutting the cake, you see the layers of the cake here. Um, it's based on game theory. I think it's very intriguing, but I like to hear from you as well. Like, what are you, what do you think we should do for these, uh, 
how should we solve the redistricting redistricting why am i having a hard time saying that word redistricting uh crisis all right uh so let's go back let's let's look at a different case now we've we've uh gil again gil v whitford is that one and you should be hearing a big decision if they figure that one out it's probably going to be up to anthony kennedy and you'll hear about it probably within a month is what i'm predicting maybe two months but i'm hoping sooner than later all right this next case i'm going to look at is i don't i didn't print off the whole case but i just have it's actually um combining this is uh two three three cases all about um, making it harder to sue employers. Okay, we have the National Labor Relations Board v. Murphy Oil USA, Ernest and Young LLP v. Morris, and Epic Systems Corp v. Lewis. And th these are all about making. Uh, so currently, um, if you work for somebody and they do something bad to you. Um, you have many opportunities to sue them for doing something bad to you. Um, depending on how th this case goes, this is going to, if it, it goes the conservative way, it's going to make it harder to sue employers. If it goes the liberal left-leaning ju uh, justice way, it will keep the status quo for most states. Okay, so I thought that was uh, an interesting one. They've been having a hard time with that one too. They heard arguments the same time as Gilby. Gilvey Whitford at the beginning of October. Still haven't figured that one out. And uh, then we have one that is, this is probably one of the best named Supreme Court cases ever. Are you ready for this? This case is called Trump v. Hawaii. Trump v. Hawaii, Trump versus Hawaii has got to be up there. Maybe the top five ever for Supreme Court cases name, names. But so yeah, you may have heard of executive order number 13,769. I know you've memorized all the executive orders that the president has, has done over the years, but this is the famous one, the infamous one, in which President Donald Trump suspended entry for 90 days of foreign nationals from seven countries identified by Congress or the executive as presenting heightened terrorism terrorism related re risks so basically countries where a lot of terrorists have been uh allegedly coming from and this was immediately challenged by uh district courts federal district courts um in multiple areas uh, looks like the the one who gets the name though is hawaii because i guess that's the state that i don't know maybe are alphabetically their first i don't know <laughs> um so they are discussing this one. Um, I'll just read the little blurb here from uh, USA Today. Is Trump's travel ban against five predominantly Muslim countries legal and constitutional? Five? I thought it was seven. Anyway, um, that question has lingered for 15 months as federal courts from Maryland to Hawaii have blocked it on both grounds. The high court's conservative majority, majority appears poised to overturn those rulings. So it is looking that uh, even the swing vote, Anthony Kennedy, will probably go the direction of the president and the Republican uh, majority Congress on that one. But still, I can't wait to make that one just based on the name of it alone. Um, now, that's a serious issue, though. Think about the immigrants uh, th uh, that want to get here, that have struggled to get here. Think about the ones who are here. Um, we are talking about real lives at stake here. Obviously, a lot of people are upset. This is going to have big implications. It's already had a chilling effect. It's already parts of this uh, has been enforced in other ways by the executive branch. So it's been um, a scary time. If you are somebody who is not a natural born citizen right now in the United States, um, I think you'd probably have to be anxious every day thinking about uh, what is this administration going to do? All right. And next up, there are a lot. I printed all the ones off, but we have eight pages worth of, of cases that have been looked at just this session. All right. And I can't talk about them all. Obviously, that would take way too long. Okay. Carpenter versus United States. Carpenter v. U.S. is one that they heard. They heard the oral, oral arguments in November. 
The issue is whether the warrantless seizure and search of historical cell phone records revealing the location and movements of a cell phone user over the course of 127 days is permitted by the Fourth Amendment. Now, the Fourth Amendment is one of those uh, amendments that has been consistently threatened since 9-11, at the very least. Um, I'm glad to see that the court's actually taking on a Fourth Amendment case. I'm going to go ahead and bring this one up on the computer so you can see. Um, also, I want to show, yeah, while I'm at it, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and give you a sneak peek of the next uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Supreme Court brief episode I'm working on, because it's related. It's about the Fourth Amendment. It's the most important Fourth Amendment case probably in his, American history, and there it is. I This is the... This is Matt v. Ohio. That's the next one. So uh, as you can see, my beautiful animations here. Oh, let's take a look here. We've got uh, Don King. Yep, Don King, who uh, was involved with that one. It's uh, one of those cases that protects the citizen from intrusion from law enforcement. But it's related to uh, Carpenter v. U.S. So let's uh, let's go ahead and... I'm going to find more info on Carpenter v. U.S. and show you because this is an important case. I didn't print this one off because I, I forgot. So let's go back here. Um, all right. So Carpenter v. U.S. So... Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Okay. This is, uh, so here's the more specific evidence here on this one. So it's April, 2011 police arrested four men in connection with a series of armed robberies. One of the men confessed to the crimes and gave the FBI, FBI his cell phone number and the numbers of other participants. Ooh, I don't know. I'm not liking this. The FBI used this information to apply for three orders from magistrate judges to obtain quote transactional records for each of the phone numbers which the judges granted under the stored communications act that act prov provides that the government may require the disclosure of certain telecommunications records when quote specific and articulable facts show that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the contents of the wire or electronic communication or the records or other information sought are relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation Okay. Yeah, they use these big words. I don't know why. The transactional records obtained by the government include the date and time of calls and the approximate location where calls began and ended based on their connections to cell towers, cell site information. So based on the cell site evidence, the government charged Tim Timothy Carpenter with, among other offenses, aiding and abetting robbery that affected interstate commerce, of course, in violation of the Hobbs Act. Carpenter moved to suppress the government's cell site evidence on Fourth Amendment grounds, and here we are. He said the FBI needed a warrant based on probable cause to obtain the records. So here we are. The arguments were heard again in November. They're having a hard time with this one. I can tell you where I stand on this one. I stand with Carpenter. I think that was a little shady how they obtained that evidence. I don't think it was constitutional. All right. Love to hear what you think too. Let me know. I'm not reading the questions yet, but I will, I promise, uh, here in a little bit. Now, the next case we is probably one that many of you have already heard of. It's the cake shop um, case. Uh, the gay couple that wanted a cake made in Colorado and the cake shop owner said, no, I don't believe in gay marriage, so I'm not going to make a cake for your gay wedding. And that one's called Masterpiece Cake Shop, LTD v. Colorado Civil Rights Commission. All right. So to read the blurb from uh, USA Today to sum it up, we have the question. Can a Colorado baker who specializes in custom wedding cakes refuse to create one for a same-sex couple? The court's decision on Jack Phillips' free speech, the, the guy who, the baker, and religious rights claims could set rules for other states with anti-discrimination laws. So this does not conflict with the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, as far as I can tell, I think. So this is something new. This is, uh, some, this is a big question here. It does have huge implications because you think about it's a private business owner. The, uh, the couple could have taken their business somewhere else. 
but they sued because he refused to provide the wedding cake for them. The guy, Phillips is his name, who has, uh, he actually wrote an op-ed just a few days ago, I think the Washington Post, he's basically saying, look, this is my beliefs, this is my bakery, I think I have First Amendment protections here. I have no freaking idea what to say about this one. I, I need to hear it all play out. This is a tough case because I can definitely see both sides. I can see both sides. It's it's a tough case. So that one is Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado, Colorado Civil Rights Commission. All right. Um, the next one's about rental cars. I did print off Carpenter. There's Carpenter. Yeah, I didn't forget. Yeah, well, and there's Cake Shop. Yeah. See, I, I'm just I'm all flutter. I don't know what I'm doing because the, the sound was not working earlier. And now I'm OK. Well, so we have bird versus U.S. So it's not like a, a, an animal that's, that sued the United States. It's a, a person named Bird, B-Y-R-D. And they went ahead and they uh, combined this case with another case called Collins v. Virginia. And again, we're talking about the Fourth Amendment here. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, show you this one on the screen just to give better context. But we're dealing with the rental car and searching the rental car. Authority, law enforcement, searching the rental car. I'll just uh, go ahead and we'll take a look at Bird. Bird v. U.S. All right. Arguments uh, were heard in January. So the facts of the case, Terrence Bird was driving on a divided four-lane highway near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, when he was pulled over, allegedly for violating a state law require, requiring drivers to use the left lane for passing only. Recognizing the car as a rental car, the officers asked Bird for his license and rental agreement, which he had difficulty locating. Once he did locate them, the officers noted that the rental agreement did not list Bird as an authorized driver. And when they ran his identification, they noted that he was using an alias and had an outstanding warrant in New Jersey. Despite the warrant's indication that it did not request extradition from other jurisdictions, the officers attempted to contact authorities in New Jersey to confirm they did not seek Bird's arrest and extradition, alleging following protocol for such situations. The officers experienced difficulty with their communications, however, and returned to Burr's car where they asked to ex asked him to exit the vehicle and about his warrant and alias. This is kind of long, but I'll go ahead and finish it out. The officers asked whether Bird had anything illegal in the car and then requested Bird's consent to search the car, noting that they did not actually need his consent because he was not listed on the rental agreement. See, this is where the I think the issue is here um, because, oh, well, you don't have the same rights because... You're not listed here. The officers alleged that Bird gave his consent, but Bird disputes this contention. The subsequent search turned up heroin and body armor in the trunk of the car. At trial, Bird moved to supp suppress the evidence challenging the initial stop, the extension of the stop, and the search. The district court determined that the violation of the traffic law justified the initial stop, and the extension of the stop was justified by the officers developing reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. Bird maintains that he did not consent to the search, so the issue remains whether he needed to consent at all. That is, whether he had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the rental vehicle, despite not being listed on the rental agreement. If he did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy, then the officer's search of the vehicle did not require his consent. The question, does a driver have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a rental car when he has the renter's permission to drive the car, but is not listed as an authorized driver on the rental agreement. Talk about some gray area. I mean, wow, this is, um, I guess the four, the founding fathers would never <laughs> have seen that one coming. Uh, I'm glad that they are being, they're taking extra care with this one because I think it's a, you know, it's good to be technical. And this is where the Supreme Court, I think a lot of times does a, a great job being thorough looking at all the details, every single detail of the case, instead of just like simply painting with a broad brush. Okay, uh, we have a couple more. First of all, there's one that stands out to me because I live in Kansas, and it, this one is based out of Kansas. 
It's uh, called City of Haze v. Voigt. I think is how you pronounce it. Or Vogt. V-O-G-T. All right. City of Haze v. Voigt, I believe is how you pronounce that. And so this one uh, is... I printed this one off. Yes. We have Matthew Voigt. Sorry, Matthew, if I mispronounced your name. He's a police officer with the city of Hayes, which is in western, northwestern Kansas, in case you're wondering. Um, I was just there a few months ago. Okay, during Voight's interview process with the city of Hayesville, wait, Hayesville? Oh, oh my gosh, this is trippy. He applied for a position in Hayesville, which is another city in Kansas, down by Wichita. <laughs> okay, so during his, his interview, he's trying to transfer from Hayes to Hayesville. He disclosed that he had kept a knife while he worked for the city of Hayes. The city of Hayesville made Voigt an offer of employment. So congratulations, dude, you got the job on his reporting, his acquisition of the knife to the city of Hayes and returning it, which Voigt did. So apparently this knife was a big issue. Upon this report, the city of Hayes chief of police ordered Voigt to issue a statement regarding the knife, which Voigt submitted nominally in addition to a letter of resignation due to his intent to accept the job with Hayesville. The Hayes poli police chief, so his old police chief, began an internal investigation into Voigt because of this nice situation. Uh, issued a more de he said, you need to have a more detailed statement with the, what, what, what happened, what's, what's been going on with this knife, buddy? And uh, this new statement that Voigt made led to additional evidence and the Hayes Police Department submitted both to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, asking the Bureau to initiate a criminal investigation. So as a result of the criminal investigation, his new job, Hayesville, said, uh, yeah, but uh, we can't give you the job anymore, okay, because of this whole criminal investigation that you're under. And so Voigt uh, was charged in state court with two felony counts related to possession of the knife. Following a probable cause hearing, the state district court determined that probable cause was lacking and dismissed the charges. So in response, Voigt brought the fe a federal lawsuit alleging the use of his compelled statements, number one, to start an investigation leading to the discovery of additional evidence concerning the knife, two, to initiate a criminal investigation, three, to bring criminal charges, and four, to the support the prosecution during the probable cause violated his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. We have a self-incrimination case. It's been a while. I think we were, we had a significant one. Um, but the question is, is the Fifth Amendment violated when we have a defendant who he was compelled, he was forced to incriminate himself uh, and the incrimination came in a probable cause hearing rather than a criminal proceeding? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's heavy. Whenever you talk about the Fifth Amendment, that's that's uh, where you better hope you've been going to law school because even me, like, that's intense stuff. There's a lot of, it's hard to dig through all that, all the details on that. All right. So the last one is the abortion case uh, that has really been causing a stir in California. That one, uh, let's see, that one is called, I told you there was a lot of important cases going on right now. That one's called National Inst. National Institute of Family and Life Advocates v. Becerra, and the issue whether the disclosures requ required by the California Re Reproductive Fact Act violate the protection set forth in the Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment, uh, the 14th Amendment using as the ways to this, for this to apply to the states. So, you know, you have, can California require anti-abortion pregnancy centers uh, to post notices informing clients about state-funded abortion and contraception services. That was, uh, that was what they were trying to do. Challengers say the law forces them to promote procedures they oppose. The state says the centers often deceive and misinform women. So at its root, we have two sides here that clearly uh, one side is pro-choice, one side is pro-life. Maybe it's not so clear, but I think... Uh, Whenever you see this, like, well, because I think John Oliver did a piece on this a few weeks ago. Um, you have one side that does not, that's the pro side, pro choice side that doesn't like how the, the, uh, the pro life side has been deceptive, 
trying to get people to not uh, turn to abortion. And so uh, whenever legislators have legislators have tried to fight this, uh, there's been pushback. Uh, so both sides have come to a head here. So this is, uh, I think we're looking, what, it, what was it? Uh, they said, I mean, just a First Amendment issue. For the free speech clause is what we're coming down to for that one. All right. I think I'm probably starting to uh, bore a lot of people. So let's go ahead and go to the questions. I will share with you uh, my screen. And that way also I will see because I need to... Okay, so also one big reason why I'm not posting this today, I didn't have a video this morning, is because uh, I'm collaborating with uh, the channel Jabril's, and it just our schedules didn't work, so the video is coming next week, and so I was like, oh, okay, I'll just take a, a week to do a live stream. Maybe this is a good opportunity. Okay, so Gavin had two questions. Do you think the U.S. Supreme Court should be elected by the legislative body, in this case Congress? like they do in Germany instead of being appointed by the president. Um, okay, yeah. So I think we already kind of have that, don't we? We have uh, the Supreme Court nominees. The, okay, so, you know, the, the president, they suggest, it's, it's a suggestion, okay? They appoint them, but it's a suggestion. The Senate has to approve, okay? So Congress is still involved with that. I think the current system is, is fine. Um, we know how divided the court's been in the last several decades and how political it has gotten. So I understand the question. I understand the need. It's definitely flawed. Um, perhaps there should be a little bit more done uh, and, and with the process itself. Um, maybe the president has too much power. Maybe this is a good case. Just, just leave it all up to Congress. I think that's worth debating. I think it's, uh, I, I just don't think this is, going to be the most pressing uh, change that should be uh, looked at looked at for solving the problem of a divided court. But I, I definitely understand why Gavin asked that question. Okay, let's see. We've got, uh, remember when Chief Justice, yeah, that's John Roberts. Yeah, he messed up the oath of uh, Obama's first inauguration. Yep. Okay. In a perfect world, would you like to see the court be less politically, polit politically, I'm struggling, politically motivated or keep it the same as it is now and where we get too many five to four decisions. Of course, I would like to see it less politically motivated. I mean, we have, I mean, look at the, the 50s, the 60s, the, even the 70s. You had a, a court that was often agreeing more than disagreeing. You had six to three, seven to two, eight to one, nine to zero oh decisions. Uh, not just any decisions, big decisions. Brown versus Board of Education is the best example of that. A huge decision, the, probably the second most important Supreme Court case in American history, and it's nine to zero. It's unanimous. I would love to see that again. And I think one big issue is we do have too many ideologue justices. I think. Uh, Rehnquist might be the first one that is guilty of this the most. We saw Scalia later on. We see, uh, you know, it's the, the, on the on the left too. We have the justices are just as guilty. Um, I think it's a big it's a big issue. And so to solve this, I mean, one thing we already have is we have justices are not elected at that level. Um, as we said earlier, they are nominated. They are appointed. They are approved by Congress. They can serve for the rest of their life if, if needed. And I think that's good. They don't have to worry about re-election, which I think is important. All they have to worry about is dying or if, whether or not they want to retire. Now, I think that the Supreme Court is the smartest, smartest branch of government. They know what they're doing, whether you agree with them or not. I think we need to have more faith in these justices, even if you don't agree with them on many issues, because they know their stuff. I've never seen a justice that clearly just didn't know what they were doing. Um, but yeah, there's got to be a way to make this less politically motivated. And that's the next question, too. In, in an ideal wor world, would you want to see the Supreme Court be apolitical, not influenced by the Democrats or Republicans? Of course. Absolutely. That's I mean, that would be, frankly, a dream come true. And then this is a pretty cynical uh, comment here. Your series has made me question 
the SCOTUS as an institution. It appears to act in open defiance of our constitution at times and weighted too strongly. After studying it, do you th still think it serves a positive role in our political system? Yes, I do. I have faith in our Supreme Court. In fact, our entire court system right now seems to be uh, doing its job. Sure, many of them clearly hate the president. That, to me, that's a little disturbing because, yeah, they're being political. They should not be political. They should not act in a way just to diminish the power of the president because they don't like him. That is wrong. Um, but I think uh, they, I mean, I think I, Anthony Kennedy is probably a good example of it. He's a justice who seems to be hard to predict where he's going to go. But then when you hear his opinions, you're like, yeah, he makes sense on, on many cases. Now, some some cases, of course, this is a little questionable, um, but you would be surprised. Even Scalia, who uh, leaned to the right, um, definitely an originalist, he, uh, he kind of was all over the place if you look at certain issues. Like um, Texas v. Johnson is a great example of look at where Antonin Scalia stood on that. And even Neil Gorshitz, who took his place, um, has surprised uh, people on a couple cases. So, and my question is why are juries expected to be unanimous in order to deliver a verdict while courts with multiple justices are just judges are allowed to be divided? My answer to that is juries are made up of common citizens and courts with multiple judges, they know their stuff <laughs> a lot more than your average citizen. I guess that's my simplest answer. It's probably not very satisfying. Oh, I skipped over Frank's question. What difference would it make which branch of government appoints the judges? Many? Oh, yeah, I guess he's responding to an earlier thing. All right. So, yeah, um, those are the questions there. Now I'm going to go to what you've been saying on the chat. All right. Yeah, am I, should I be afraid? All right. So I'm going to just go back. No, I'll start it like I'm going to start as far back as I can. All right. Well, as far back as I can see is where they talk about Wayfair v. South Dakota. All right. Uh, my favorite cases are when the guy, this is knowing better, the favorite cases when the guy is plainly guilty and doesn't context that, but hopes their knowledge of law and order will get them out with the technicality. All right, I'm looking for questions here. You guys are just talking to yourselves. That is fine. That is perfectly fine. Uh, let's see. If you have questions, ask me now. Lots of opinions here. I like it. Do you support net neutrality? Um, that's another issue where I see both sides, and I, I'm sympathetic to both sides. I generally lean towards net neutrality because I do feel like. Uh, the internet has become a utility, and I feel like uh, you have less opportunities for a market to work. And I feel like uh, monopolies form and less competition is there. What are your thoughts on the SCOTUS case about online sales tax? That's Wayfair v. South Dakota. I have not looked at that one. I'll be honest with you. I'm going to Google it right after this, though. All right. What do you think is the best way to solve gerrymandering? Uh, in case you missed it earlier, I think uh, algorithms using formulas to divide up the districts so it's not so tied to human emotion or even human logic. I mean, get the let the robots determine it. Let the robots determine the districts. Okay. Um, how would you make the court less politically motivated? That's their job. I don't think it's their job. I mean, I think everybody is politically motivated as a human being. Like you, when you're working, if you work at a place and there's only two people working, you and a coworker, you want to have more power than that person generally. So, I mean, I just think it's, I don't think it's a, it's just more of a human behavior. Uh, I think the FBI director, okay, Dylan says, the lifetime appointment seems stupid to me. I think like the FBI director, it should be 10 years max. That You know, I meant to say that earlier. 
I think that's a good idea. I don't know if 10 years is, is uh, long enough, but I think uh, definitely maybe 15 or 20. I think 20 actually, I heard some pundit was arguing that a while back and I was like, yeah, that's not, I remember his argument was pretty rational. All right, looking for, uh, I heard, yeah, term limits, people talking about term lim limits uh, for justices. Well, term limits for politicians, that doesn't seem to be having the effect. Uh, let's see. I have, a, I have a book somewhere about how term limits actually have not had the effect, the effects that they have wanted them to have for um, at the state level. So that, that's got me questioning term limits for uh, legislators. All right, and then they're talking a lot about the abortion case, and that's always that's always heated when you talk about that issue. How did I get into teaching? Uh, I got into teaching. Well, I started out in uh, broadcasting. I was a I worked in radio and TV. My first degree was in broadcast journalism, actually just journalism, I guess. And uh, then I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> And then I started uh, working as a valet manager at uh, various hospitals, and I liked being a manager. And then I remembered what my mom told me when I was in high school, um, and that was, you should be a social studies teacher. You should teach high school, high school social studies. And I said, Mom, why would I want to teach social studies when I hate high school or, you know, I hate school? Why would I want to return to this evil place? Um, so I just kind of laughed or laughed at her and but then I several years later you know as a manager and as someone who was always a history and geography dork that never went away I was like man that would be that would be cool to do that and so I went back to school to become a teacher so I was in my mid-20s when I went back to school and and then yeah uh, kind of combined my journalism background with my teaching history all right next question is DACA unconstitutional? I think it is, but should they pay for their parents? Um, DACA, <laughs> I think you could make a good argument that it's unconstitutional. Um, however, I think you can make an argu argument that it is constitutional. Um, if you look at that Plyler uh, case that I've, I've posted, um, the Plyler case was about uh, the students who uh, were sons and daughters of illegal immigrants, and they ultimately determined they should have the right to an education anyway, even though taxpayers are paying for it. Um, so I think I tend to go that direction for the, for the DACA issue. If you, It's Plyther v. Doe, if you look it up. I have a video about that one. Do you think AMK will retire after this term? Yeah, I think so. How should lo kids learn evolution in school? Uh, they should learn it in science class. <laughs> Matt, do you think the Supreme Court, oh, Dylan has another one. The Supreme Court would function better if there was one or two reps per state, like the Senate or House, better representation per capita. That is a fascinating idea. I am intrigued. Uh, if you can send me any articles about that, Dylan, I, I wanna read more about that. Let the robots determine things. Do you want Skynet, Matt? Because that's it, it's Skynet. <laughs> uh, no, I don't want Skynet. I am. Actually, I freak out about the robots taking over all the time. Automation is something that I'm not a big fan of. Um, shouldn't we have an Internet Bill of Rights to stop political censorship? Ooh, Gregory, I like that idea. Free speech all the way. Uh, Wayf I need to really check out this Wayfair v. South Dakota. I feel bad for that I didn't bring it up or I didn't look into it. Yeah, 20 years. Okay. Uh, I keep seeing liberty or death. I like liberty or death, Nate. Uh, <laughs> do you have a favorite presidential biography? Yes, I do. And that's the big reason. It's a big reason why I have my opinion of Harry Truman. Is it here? Yeah, it is here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Truman by David McCulloch. And, uh, it really... Uh -oh. 
I used to think a lot, a lot less of Harry Truman before I read that book. He literally changed my mind. Maybe he's just that good of a writer, but he, he gave a lot of facts as well. Oh, Teddy, what's your question, buddy? I didn't see it. Teddy, I missed your question. Say it again. Uh, liberty or death again. I get it, Nate. Liberty or death. Uh, will I ever do Supreme Court briefs for other countries like Canada or Israel? Oh, okay. You know what? Um, you were not the first one to suggest that. I just feel like really out of my element. And I feel like if I do that, I'm going to have to collaborate with somebody. I just, I don't want to get anything wrong. And I've made a few mistakes over the years, but I think I would make a lot of mistakes if I just dove into the Supreme Court cases of other countries. Um, I might start with Britain, but you say Israel has a lot of good cases, so I I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna check it out. Oh, thanks, Teddy. Yeah. Uh, oh, and thank you, Dylan, for messaging me the information. I would love to hear. So, Jamie, hi, Jamie. Love to hear your opinion on Edward Snowden. With our privacy and securities in decline since 9/11, do you believe he will be remembered as a patriot? Yes, I think already he's remembered. I think if you were to poll younger people. Edward Snowden is a hero, most people will say, most younger people. So I think that history will treat him well. It's very tragic that he is stuck in Russia, that he cannot come back. Um, I, I, I'm not very happy with how uh, the situation, like he shouldn't be, like they say, well, why doesn't he just come back so he can just go to trial? And what's, uh, will he get a fair trial? I don't think he would if he came back. Um, <laughs> Snowden is the hero. What's your opinion on? Oh, I think I skipped some comments here. Okay, uh, Mr. Beat seems like a... oh, thank you, Jacob. I, I'm okay, I guess. Are you in reading through history, friends or enemies? <laughs> uh, we're friends, uh, we enjoy each other. I wish I talked more to him, actually. We get so busy during the school year. Oh, oh, there we are. Okay, uh, but I'm open to see. That's the uh, that's the government. Uh, but I'm open to uh, additional changes, and I know that uh, background checks are already in a place. I think background checks should be uh, stricter. I think we should expect the same for anybody who owns a weapon, uh, as or we do our police officers. It shouldn't be just really easy to get a weapon. That that's the simple way I'm going to put it. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think I need to get out of my comfort zone. I keep seeing comments about other countries. I need, I need to do that. <laughs> yes, we get it, Nathan. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Welcome back. He's back. Yeah, I got I, Skynet or the government. Uh, <laughs> what do you think will happen with uh, to Julian Assange? Talk about another tragedy. I mean, he, uh, I don't, does he, he even, ha he doesn't even have internet access anymore as far as I can, I can tell. Um, oh yes, Knowing Better is making a video about gun control. Make sure you check it out. It's gonna be very comprehensive. Julian Assange, um, again, another person who I think uh, has got a bad rap overall. I'm a huge fan of, of freedom of speech. I, I don't like censor censorship at all. And so to see, I mean, I, I'll never forget um, when WikiLeaks uh, dumped all that info about the Iraq war and the effect that that had on me as a, young, a much younger person and just really get, getting me questioning things. And I never would have questioned things like I did if I hadn't seen what he had uh, released with WikiLeaks. Um, okay, Edwards v. Canada, I will check that out, okay. Uh, are you a Bill Meyer real time fan? Michael Hayden will be on tonight. Uh, Bill Meyer, uh, I have a love hate relationship with him. Sometimes I really can't stand what he says. Other times I'm like, yes. So I do, I do uh, pay attention to him though. 
I pay attention to people on the right and the left and in between. I get all sides of the spectrum. I'm also a, a I watch Crowder, so to, you know it balances out the Bill Meyer. Um, how many more justices do you think President Trump will have to appoint? Uh, hard to tell. I think uh, it depends on what, what happens with midterms and if if Trump's going to get reelected in 2020, which if you ask nearly everybody, they would say no. But uh, those same people didn't predict predict him getting elected in 2016. Uh, so that's this is just too big of a question. All right. Have, ever, have people ever tried to get me fired from my political views? No. My political views are all over the place. I'm not really an ideologue. I think that helps being a teacher, actually. And I realize with a captive audience, you don't teach these kids what to think. You teach them how to think. That's very important. Where do you land on the Israel-Palestine debate? Well, speaking of which, my, uh, my, <laughs> my video about... Um, hatred of Jews, I should say, instead of using anti-Semitism, because apparently that triggered some people. Um, that's a very controversial video, apparently. I didn't think it would be that controversial, um, but I do understand the hatred uh, that people have on both sides there. It's just a mess, and it's um, it's been ongoing for so long that imagine being born into that and then being raised to hate the other side. I mean, uh, I do... I have a radical idea. Uh, I think it should be a one state solution. I lean towards that in a secular government and Palestinians and uh, Israelis already live side by side in many places there. If they can somehow get representation for the Palestinians so that they're satisfied, I think they should go that route. But Israel does not want to be a secular state. They want to be uh, a, a Jewish state. So that's a, that's a problem. Okay. Um, do you, oh, uh, do you know, have any opinions on how the Bush administration reacted to domestic terrorism after 9-11 and allowed NSA data collection, which was previously pushed back by the public in the 90s? Yeah, listen to my George W. Bush song. You'll get an idea of where I stand on that. I'm not a big fan of domestic spying. Uh, well, thank you, Rob, for the, that was a tough video to make. I realized I, I left, I did leave details out, um, that I probably should have put in there, the, the uh, video about Jewish hatred around the world. And, uh, I started the story with talking about, um, early Christians and I should have talked about how the Romans, well, how other groups too, but yeah, how the Jew, the Jews were kicked out of, um, what was formerly known as Israel. I should have put that in there, but I didn't. Uh, okay, let's see. Yeah, I know, Flame Fusion. So many anti-Semitic Marxists. Uh, well, Marxists, is that the right term? No, I don't think they're Marxists. In fact, they many of the comments of that video, they said that uh, the, the Bolshevik Jews were the ones who, <laughs> who killed 20 to 30 million people, which Stalin was not a Jew, okay? And Lenin was barely Jewish. It was really his grandfather. So I don't think that I, it's really a lot of uns unsubstantiated claims that they make with that. Do you think nine is the right number for a uh, right number of SCOTUS justices? Um, no, I think there should, I think they're, um, I think that if they want it, want it to be less political, one way is maybe to increase the number, maybe to, uh, maybe, I don't know. 11 would be a start. I, I think that's reasonable. Will you upload the stream to watch later? Yeah, this will save automatically. Um, <laughs> okay. And Nate's really going at it. Edwards v. Canada. Okay, I'll look into it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Um, okay, this is the last question I'll take and then I'll wrap it up here. Uh, Mark, what's your opinion on our current first past the post voting system and, and would ranked choice voting be better? Yes, ranked choice voting would be better. Okay, uh, I think we should get rid of first past the post. I think it is uh, not effective. And you guys already know my opinion about the Electoral College. It's, uh, I think it's really hurt uh, our country overall, but I understand why the the framers 
established it. Times have changed, though. Times have changed. That's the bottom line. I think every vote should be equal, and it currently is not. I feel like that my vote in Kansas is worth so much more than a vote in Texas. I'll just leave it at that. I think uh, for, uh, rank choice voting, if you have two rounds, you have uh, maybe a dozen candidates the first round, uh, maybe the top you know, six after that. And then I think you shouldn't have one president anymore. I think you should have three. You should have three presidents, okay? A council. The idea that one person, and I'm saying this as the pres president's guy on YouTube. I'm the president's guy. I've become that person because that's something that I've always been most into learning about is presidential, American president history is my stick, right? And I say that and I realize that this is a, this is an outdated system and it needs to be reformed. So I think that's the first time I've ever said that uh, publicly. So you heard it here first. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you everyone for watching. I appreciate the uh, conversation and uh, I just want to thank you for watching. And if you have uh, additional comments uh, after the, the broadcast ends, I'll leave the video up and you can put them in the comments below the video. And I'll also put up links to all these uh, Supreme Court cases I've talked about. So. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching.